Hello, my name is Todd Bennett. In the last episode, we talked about obedience and our need to obey the commandments. And we talked about the mezuzah and writing the commandments on the doorposts of our house and on our gates. And then we looked at Acts 15, which brought us full circle back to the Sabbath as part of the pattern and the path to obedience. And we saw that our belief is expressed by our actions as we live set-apart lives according to the Torah. And of course, this leads many people to some questions when they recognize that they should be obeying the commandments. They want to know, well, how many commandments are there? Which ones do I need to obey? And can we even obey the commandments? Because many of us have been taught in Christianity that uh, we can't obey the commandments. It's just too difficult, as if uh, Elohim was uh, sadistic and, and and cruel to the Israelites, and he gave them these commandments which they couldn't obey. And of course, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. In Deuteronomy 30.11, we have Moses telling us that the commandments are not too difficult. And we read in 1 John 5.3, For this is the love of Elohim, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. So we see even that uh, obeying the commandments and the giving of the commandments are all about love which is very contrary to what many people learn in Christianity. So, I don't like to get into numbering the commandments. There's a popular Jewish tradition that there are 613 commandments. And, you know, you can go through their list if you want, and you can see that some of them duplicate and overlap. The issue is that we should be obeying the commandments that apply to us. And the way we do that is by reviewing the commandments and applying the ones that, that uh, are applicable to our situation in life. And so it helps if we remember the lesson of the tzitzit. And remember, wearing the tzitzit is supposed to remind us uh, that we're to be part of a nation of priests. And when we don those uh, tzitzit, we're supposed to be considering ourselves as priests. And of course, it's, we're not Levitic priests, but rather the Melchizedek priests, the priesthood of the firstborn. The Levitic priesthood failed in its duty, as we read about in Ezekiel 44.10. says, But the Levites who went far from me, going astray from me after their idols, when Yisrael went astray, shall bear their punishment. And Ezekiel 48.11 said, This shall be for the con consecrated priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept my charge, who did not go astray, when the people of Yisrael went astray, as the Levites did. And of course, uh, Zadok comes the, from the word Zadok, which means righteous. And of course, that's part of the word Melchizedek. Melech is king, uh, Zadok is righteous, and so we get the idea of the, the righteous priest or the priestly king. And of course, Yeshua came as the high priest in the order of Melchizedek to teach, fulfill, and point the way for us. And many Christians completely miss this purpose and function of the Messiah. While they recognize that he came to cleanse us from our sins, they fail to make the connection that sin is disobedience. And so, while his death and resurrection provides us with forgiveness and cleansing, which result from our disobedience, uh, they've been taught that he did away with the commandments, and, and now we're under this vague uh, concept of grace. But what they fail to understand is that the grace was the forgiveness and the cleansing that we didn't deserve because of our unrighteousness, because of our sin, because of our disobedience. It doesn't now mean that we continue in disobedience and lawlessness once we're forgiven and cleansed. Uh, that it just absolutely makes no sense whatsoever. But that's the delusion that most Christians are under. And that's leading them down a path of destruction unless they wake up. And really it's what's considered insulting the spirit of grace that we read about in Hebrews 10, 29. It says, Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the son of Elohim underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace? And of course, that's what many people are doing when they, they receive you know, Jesus into their hearts and ask for forgiveness, and then just go on sinning. Essentially, they're saying, Please cleanse me by your precious blood, but then I'm going to just go keep sinning uh, and doing the very same things that your blood was cleansing me from. Again, it doesn't make any sense. But many who come out of Christianity have been scarred by this Christian doctrine of grace that essentially 
There's nothing we can do at all. It's all about Jesus and it's all about his blood. And so because of that, they just think, well, because we're helpless, we just keep doing whatever we do and just keep relying on the grace of, of Jesus. And of course, that's just a really distorted uh, concept that comes out of uh, many of the writings of Paul. So, while well, Christians correctly understand that Yeshua died and shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins, they still don't know exactly what to do with the commandments. And, of course, those coming out of the Christian system share in some of this confusion because uh, they don't know exactly how to apply the commands to their lives because this is something they're not used to doing. And that's why the tzitzit are so important. And they kind of set us in the straight path. Uh, the commandment concerning the tzitzit that we read previously in Numbers 15 uh, actually provides us with a reset. It starts at 37 and then ends at verse 41 by saying, I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your Elohim. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. So basically, it brings us back to the beginning, the first commandment of the Ten Commandments that were given at Sinai that we read about in Exodus 20 provides us with a reset and basically, hey, start from the beginning and go from there. And, of course, part of the important process is identifying yourself with this creator, yod heh vav -Heh. Once you identify the one who you serve, then you can recognize who you need to obey and whose commandments you need to obey. And, of course, that name itself, yod heh vav -Heh, if we looked at it in the Paleo-Hebrew, we see the Yud represents an arm. The hay represents a person with upstretched arms uh, in worship, and, and hay also means the spirit, the breath. And uh, the vav is a connector, a stake, a nail. It connects things together, and then you have a hay on the other side of that vav. So you have basically the arm, and we know that Messiah is referenced as the arm of Elohim. This arm connecting uh, the spirits, the spirit of Elohim, with our spirit, connecting them together. He connects heaven and earth. He connects us with our creator. He's the one that restores. And of course, he was the word manifested in and through creation from the very beginning. And he's the one that connects heaven and earth, even as we see between the um, the, the Shamayim, uh, the, the heavens and the earth, he connects them, the Aleph Ta, we can read that actually in the first word of the uh, Hebrew scriptures. So, with that understanding, that's why the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 uh, directed new believers to go to the synagogue uh, where Moses or the Torah was taught, where we read every Shabbat. So we, we can uh, learn about this word. Yeshua came and lived it and taught it and showed us how to do it. Uh, but for people that aren't familiar with the Torah, they need to get cleaned up, they need to get into the assembly, and they start need to start uh, learning these commandments, which are so foreign to them. So when we consider that Acts 15 scenario, where people were led to the uh, commandments, it, it would behoove us now to look at, well, what was the context of that discussion? And we see what they were really talking about was salvation. In fact, we read Acts 15.1, and certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So the underlying conversation here is, well, what, what do we do to be saved here? And some were saying you have to be circumcised. And uh, Peter later on said in 1511, uh, but we believe that through the grace of the Master Messiah Yeshua, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And then we see James going on and giving certain instructions uh, to the new believers in you know, certain commandments that they had to start obeying immediately so that they could get cleaned up, they could separate themselves from uh, the pagan worship system that they were involved in, start living like priests so that they could then fellowship with the other believers in the assembly and then start hearing more of the word, ultimately, obviously, so that it, they could obey the commandments. So the entire conversation about salvation pointed to obeying the commandments and learning the commandments. And now, this is very contrary to what's taught in most Christian churches. But the question is not what you've learned in your church or what your pastor 
is preached on Sunday, but what did Messiah teach uh, about the scriptures and salvation? And uh, let's start by examining just one scripture about what it means to be saved by Elohim. We read in Exodus 14.30, So Yahuwah saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. The word saved there is referring to saving them from Pharaoh, from physical death. And, of course, there's many, many scriptures that talk about uh, Yah saving his people. And it's in a physical context. It's meant, for, you know, saving them from oppressors, from their enemies, and in this case, uh, from Pharaoh and his army. But that's not what most people are talking about when they think about being saved. The real question on most people's minds, and within the context of the Christian religion, is really, how do I get eternal life? Okay, that's what they mean by salvation. And again, most Christians recognize that we receive forgiveness of our sins by the blood of Yeshua, but it's important to recognize that forgiveness is not the same as salvation. And salvation is not a decision that we make. Rather, it's a decision that the master makes in the end. You see, Christianity essentially has it backwards. Uh, many, many Christians believe that if they said a prayer of faith or a confession of faith, uh, or went, you know, went on an altar call or raised their hand uh, at, at a Christian meeting or said a four-step prayer that they immediately have salvation from that point forward. And, of course, it's essentially a formula that guarantees instantaneous salvation, but that's just not correct. And it leads to doctrines such as once saved, always saved, or eternal security. And none of these have any basis in the scriptures, and they actually defy all reason, because there's never any promise for immediate salvation. Uh, the scriptures repeatedly indicate that it's in the end that, that we're saved, and that decision is up to uh, the Messiah, and that's why we have faith, belief, and trust in him that he will, in fact, save us in the end, but uh, that's it's something that doesn't occur instantaneously. And so many have been deceived into thinking that as long as they made a decision or said a prayer at some point in their lives, that they're all set for eternity, no matter what they do or how they live their lives. And this is completely contrary to the words and actions of the Messiah and the Scriptures. So let's take a look at what Yeshua actually had to say about eternal life. When we read about it in Matthew 19, beginning at 16, it says, now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is Elohim. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Yeshua said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Yeshua said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, Assuredly I say to you, it's hard for a rich man uh, to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of an eel than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of Elohim. When his disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Yeshua looked to them and said, With men this is impossible, but with Elohim all things are possible. Now, notice his unequivocal response. Uh, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He didn't hesitate. And we read the same account in Mark 10 and Luke 18. It's in all the Synoptic Gospels, and this is, this is solid, what Yeshua said. In Luke 10, we read another uh, instance, uh, beginning at 25, And behold, a certain scribe stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the Torah? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. So the scribe quoted 
Deuteronomy 6, 4, uh, which is known as the Shema, and which Yeshua actually described as the greatest commandment when somebody asked him, uh, what's the greatest commandment? He said, Hero Israel, Shema Israel. So again, Yeshua is telling people, if you want eternal life, you obey the Torah, you obey the commandments. In fact, in his parable of the sheep and the goats, he defines people by their conduct. In Matthew 25, 46, he says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, he's talking about the goats, but the righteous into eternal life. Uh, the righteous were the sheep. And of course, in that parable of the sheep and the goats, he defines them by their actions, by what they did in their life. So, our con he didn't define whether they, they, they uh, said a prayer at some point in their life, or they believed in him, or, or you know, went to an altar call. He defined them by what they did. So I recommend you read Matthew 25, that parable of the sheep and the goats. It's very powerful. It's one of the last teachings that Yeshua gave. Uh, in John 3.15, he says, But whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, again, belief is not necessarily the way we think of it in our Western minds is, Oh, I, I have this feeling, I have this emotion. I believe in him in my mind. No, belief is something that uh, we do. Our belief is expressed by our actions. So if you believe Yeshua, then you do what he told you to do. And your actions will then uh, express your belief. Even Paul admits that your actions uh, are part of salvation in Romans 2. Beginning at 5, we read, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in a day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of Elohim, who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish, on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, where there's no partiality with Elohim. So again, he, Paul is showing that people's actions are going to determine their fate. And people who use Paul's statements concerning grace to justify their disobedience uh, are leading to destruction. And of course, this has happened uh, to many throughout the centuries, as we read in 2 Peter 3.16, when he was referring to Paul, and it says, and also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, and they do so also to the rest of the scriptures. So, Currently, we see people taking Paul's words, taking this concept of grace that they read about in his writings, his letters, and they twist them, uh, and they come up with contrary doctrines that are completely opposed to the formula that, that Yeshua gave and to the, the message that Yeshua gave regarding eternal life. And they're twisting these uh, statements from Paul to their own destruction. People have been doing this. Uh, since the time that Peter wrote that passage. So, you can't discard the statements of Yeshua, okay? If we're saved through his name, according to Acts 4.12, and that's what the scripture says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So, if we're saved according to the name Yeshua, then you better be following his commandments and his directions and his instructions that he gave for eternal life. Now, if you're saved according to the name of Paul, well, okay, then go ahead and take his, his letters and go ahead and twist them to your own destruction. But when I stand before Messiah, my faith and my trust is going to be in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, and therefore my belief is going to be expressed through my obedience to his statements and what he did and what he said. So we're saved by our belief in Yeshua. And of course, we read about that in John 3.16, probably the most commonly uh, quoted scripture about being saved. Uh, For Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, we obey his words 
and that expresses that we actually believe him, okay? You express your belief through your actions. James made this very clear in James 2.18, but someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And James is basically saying, belief is nothing. It's really what you do that it expresses what you believe. And, in fact, you express your love through your actions, too. In John 14.15, Messiah said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So, again, we express our belief and our love for him through our obedience to the commandments. Keeping the commandments is righteousness. Disobeying the commandments is lawlessness. And of course, in 1 John 3, 4, we read, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And this is the continuing problem with mankind. It's disobedience. Disobedience is sin. And Yeshua came to deliver mankind from the curse that began in the garden, resulting from disobedience. Uh, in fact, the definition of his name we see in Matthew, uh, Matthew 1, 21, it says, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. So saving his people from their sins is his purpose, and it's his very name. But notice it's his people, okay? In order to be one of his people, you have to be in covenant with him. So that's the, the, you know, when we read about, you shall be my people and I shall be your Elohim, that's the covenant relationship and that's when you become one of his people is when you're in covenant. So Yeshua died for the sins of those who are in covenant relationship with him. He didn't die for, the, for your sins if all you're going to do is keep on sinning. And that's a lie and it's a fraud that's been perpetrated throughout Christianity. Obedience is not optional. It's an integral part of being in the covenant, and it's an integral part of eternal life. And sadly, many say that the Torah is not a salvation issue, but this is simply incorrect. And it's a nice way to present the Torah to skittish Christians who are indoctrinated in grace and, and are, you know, don't want to obey the commandments, but it's a lie. And this seems to be the new mantra in the Hebrew roots uh, movements as folks are uh, using it to make the Torah observance more palatable to Christians. But I fear this may be misleading to some, and I feel compelled to point out that obedience as taught by the Messiah is central to our covenant walk. And remember that disobedience is the reason why mankind was expelled from the Garden of Eden. The Garden represented the kingdom of Elohim on earth, and it was governed by his Torah, by his commandments, by his instructions. And it was mankind's failure to follow the rules of the kingdom that resulted in their being expelled. And it was the mercy of Elohim that led to his establishing a covenant that would make a way for us to return to the covenant assembly of Israel. And central to that covenant is the Torah. So as a result, obedience to the Torah is nothing to be ashamed of and certainly not to be diminished when you're talking to people about you know, finding their Hebrew roots. Um, interestingly, but for the religion of Christianity, this wouldn't even be a discussion. In the past, when a stranger joined with Israel, they weren't typically concerned about a guarantee of going to heaven. They wanted to follow the Elohim of Israel, and therefore they would agree to obey him and worship him as instructed in his Torah. Their actions of obedience to the Torah revealed that they served Elohim and not some other pagan god. And it was their actions that defined their status and their relationship with Elohim. So sadly, Christianity has become so fixated on salvation that they often neglect the path that gets you there, which is the covenant. So it's become a religion so motivated on what a person can get for themselves, salvation, that the entire covenant gets turned upside down and inside out. Uh, they want the dessert, essentially, before the meal. But salvation is the end of the journey. It's not the beginning. We're supposed to give first and receive later. That's the pattern of the Messiah. He gave his life and trusted the Father to resurrect him from the dead. And we give our lives and our service to Elohim and place our faith and trust in him. We rely on his love and mercy to take care of us now and after we die. And in the meantime, we live our lives in accordance with his instructions. When we enter into the covenant, we place our faith and trust in Yeshua's blood 
which was shed in fulfillment of that covenant. Now, many modern Christians evangelize by posing the standard question, what must I do to be saved? And again, the focus is not, what can I do for Elohim, or what does Elohim want from me, but rather, what can I get from him? And this is a symptom of our society and our culture, and it results in a predictable response from the modern Christian religion. The answer is a simple and fast multi-step formula and prayer for achieving salvation instantly. Once the person has uttered the prayer, it's claimed that the person is instantly saved, and sometimes they only have to raise a hand or go to the front of the church, as I've already mentioned. Again, it's simply not scriptural, but sadly, it appears that this mentality is now steeped into the Hebrew Roots community, which consists of many people who came from the Christian church, who came out of Babylon. But we have to be careful that we don't bring these uh, doctrines and beliefs with us in our journey out of Babylon. Uh, sometimes we've been so beaten up by the doctrine of grace that, you know, you're almost afraid to speak about the need to obey the Torah, to, to keep the commandments. It almost seems like it's not politically correct to some people. But I'd encourage my brethren uh, that you don't need to make excuses or diminish your obedience by stating that it's not a salvation issue. If our Messiah had followed that belief and lived a life contrary to the Torah, uh, he would have disqualified himself from that position. He lived perfectly and his famous words are, follow me. We're supposed to follow him in, in the way that he obeyed and how he taught us to obey. Uh, he needed to be holy and live set apart, according to the Torah, in order to be the unblemished Lamb of Elohim. And again, he tells us to follow him and walk perfectly as he walked. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing. There's no reason to diminish the instructions whatsoever. You know, we've all been tarnished by sin, and thus we need the washing of his blood to cleanse us. And once we're clean, we need to stay holy and live perfect. We're to follow the path blazed by the Messiah, which involves obedience. And that's specifically why when Yeshua was asked what a man must do to inherit eternal life, he responded, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He then went on to say, if you want to be perfect, Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. Uh, he was always encouraging people to go beyond the letter of the Torah and find the true heart of the Torah. He tells us to enter by the narrow gate, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it, Matthew 7, 14. In fact, he went on to state uh, in verse 24, Strive to enter through the narrow gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, he will answer and say to you, I do not know you, where you are from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you, where you are from, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. We read about that in Luke 13, 24 through 27. And this is a powerful word. He met with these people. He ate with them. He taught with them. Yet he, he proclaims, I do not know you. He doesn't know them because they're not in covenant relationship with him. Again, the relationship comes through the covenant. And we know this because he calls them workers of iniquity. They're deemed wicked and lawless because they refuse to obey the terms of the covenant, which are the commandments. So the path to life is narrow, difficult, and few will find it. So when we talk about obedience being about blessings and disobedience being about curses, we need to follow these statements to their natural conclusion. While our actions certainly have immediate and tangible consequences in the flesh, they also have eternal consequences. Your actions reveal your heart, and if you want to obey then you're expressing your love for the Master. And to the contrary, if you don't want to obey or you refuse to obey, then you're expressing your lack of love. Again, Yeshua said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you keep my commandments. It's that simple. Obedience is how we express our love, and obedience to the Torah is how we live righteously. It's the righteous who inherit eternal life, and the righteous are defined by the way they live their lives, not because of some simple confession of faith or act that they did in the past. In fact, 
It's the workers of iniquity who refuse to obey, who are cursed, rejected, and sent away to be punished, according to Yeshua. Now, this is pretty serious stuff. And that's why I'm not uh, being religiously correct, because Yeshua was not religiously correct. He offended many with the truth, because the truth does not usually fit within people's religious paradigms. Yeshua was trying to save people by getting them on the right path so that they could receive his forgiveness that he provides through the covenant. Ultimately, Yeshua will judge all because he has inherited the earth. And thankfully, he's provided us with his standard of judgment in the scriptures. So there will be no surprises. He told us how he would judge the wicked and the righteous, and it always comes down to how they live their lives. Uh, incredibly, in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, it sounds as though he was specifically trying to warn future Christians when he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The word lawless specifically means without the Torah. So you might want to rethink the notion that obedience is not a salvation issue. Salvation to me is whether I get back into the kingdom, back into the garden where I can partake of the tree of life. That's where we have eternal life. And once again, the scriptures are very clear on this point. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside of the dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. We read that in Revelation 22, 14 through 15. Now, could it be that the new lie is that obedience to the Torah is not a salvation issue? Yeshua was the Torah of the flesh. He taught the true Torah. He lived, died, and was resurrected because of the Torah. Therefore, if you reject the Torah then you're essentially rejecting the Messiah and his, his message. So the Messiah was very clear about this, and we also need to be clear about it so we don't mislead anyone. Our message must be honest and truthful. Yeshua had many people turn away because they found his message to be too hard. Uh, we must be prepared for the same response to our message. It will definitely not appeal to the masses. And of course, we see the trend in Christianity that they want to water down the message and make it easy so they can fill, you know, the mega churches. It's a, it's a numbers game in many respects. But Yeshua was not about numbers. He was about the purity and the truth of his message. So it's by the shed blood of Yeshua, the prophesied Lamb of Elohim, that we can enter through the door that leads to life. We also receive forgiveness from the blood when we sin and repent. But it's all within the context of the covenant. We're sending a false message and a mixed message if we attract people to the Torah and tell them that it's only about being blessed in the here and now and, and essentially making it optional. It's not optional. The Torah is the rule of the kingdom, and it needs to be practiced, rehearsed, lived, and perfected by those who desire to receive salvation. It's time to get away from our emphasis on personal salvation that we inherited in Christianity and start thinking about the covenant and the kingdom because that's where we will be spending eternal life, and it's all about the kingdom. Yeshua said in Matthew 5, beginning at 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the Torah till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. And of course, in verse 9, the word, when it says, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments, the word really does not mean break. A better translation is loosens or relaxes. So it's the people who relax the commandments who will be least. But the ones who break the commands won't be getting in at all, as we already mentioned. They're lawless. They're the workers of iniquity. You don't get in if you break the commandments, okay? 
So in Matthew 7.23 and Luke 13.27, Yeshua specifically tells uh, lawless people to depart from him because he, he doesn't know them. And those who practice lawlessness are not in the covenant. They're not going to get into the kingdom. Speaking of the kingdom, we're going to talk more about being kingdom-minded in the next episode. Because as we come out of Christianity, we can see that many of our motivations have been self-centered. Salvation has is, is, uh, been a, a personal quest for many people. And their faith has been really just centered on themselves. But that's really not the correct thinking that we're supposed to have when we're in the covenant. We're supposed to be thinking about the kingdom and, of course, what, our, what we can do for the service of our king. So we need to come from the self-centered mentality of, of getting saved to this uh, servant thinking of how can we serve the king in the kingdom. And, and that, that involves some adjustment in our thinking and becoming kingdom-minded. And we're going to talk about that a little more in the next episode. But until then, uh, my name is Todd Bennett from www.shamayisrael.net. Shalom.